Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today, we have a very special guest with us. Her name is Christy Yamaguchi. Christy captured the gold medal in the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville, France in figure skating. She is also a two-time world champion and U.S. national champion. Christy is a member of the U.S. Figure Skating Hall of Fame, World Figure Skating Hall of Fame, and the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame. She recently received the USOPC's Jesse Owens Olympic Spirit Award for serving as a powerful force for good in society, as well as the 2019 Heisman Humanitarian Award for the work of her Always Dream organization. Following a long and successful career in professional figure skating, including 10 years of touring with Stars on Ice, Christy took to dance floor to win the Mirror Ball Trophy with partner Mark Ballas in season six of the popular TV show Dancing with the Stars. Christy resides in the San Francisco Bay Area with her husband, two-time U.S. Olympian and Stanley Cup champion Brett Hedekin, and their daughters, Kira and Emma. Christy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Maggie. Great to be on the show. And Brian, thank you for having me. Of course, Christy, it's such an honor to have you on the show. I, I remember talking to my mom last week. I'm like, mom, we're going to have Christy Yamaguchi on the podcast. She was jumping up and down in the kitchen. And just some <laughs> more background information, like we watched your ice skating competitions back when I was a kid, right? So around 1992, I was like in elementary school. So it's like, you were such an inspiration for us. And to have you on the show today, it's like, whoa, this is so surreal. You know, so thank you so much for everything that you've done. But we want to hear your story. What was your upbringing like? Where'd you grow up? And how'd you get into ice skating? Yeah, sure. I uh, am a California girl. I grew up in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, particularly the East Bay in a small town of Fremont, California. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really, it was a pretty sleepy town when I was growing up and mostly suburb, mostly, you know, um, not super diverse, but I diverse enough where I didn't feel, um, you know, too much like an, a minority. Uh, I mean, a little bit, but I also, uh, my family was also part of the local uh, church, um, which was, uh, you know, a larger Asian American community uh, to be a part of. Um, and yeah, I started skating when I was about six years old, um, like first grade. And I remember my mom, I wanted to go and my mom said, oh, well, when you are learning to read, then you can go. And then I figure that's old enough. So yeah, started skating at six um, at a rink in Hayward, California called Southland in the mall and just loved it from the very beginning. And at that point, it was just you know, taking off from there. I have uh, an older sister, a younger brother. And so that middle child thing, which I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I agree with all of the stereotypes of a middle child, but, uh, and then, uh, yeah. So I'm fourth generation uh, Japanese American. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anything else <laughs> to add? <laughs> no, it's a really insightful um, childhood experience too, because I think Maggie here also grew up in San Francisco in the Sunset District. So you guys have a lot in common already. But I'm kind of curious yeah. too, because knowing that you're one of the first Asian American winners in the ice skating ring for the United States, who were your idols growing up? Because it's hard to imagine ourselves in those positions if we don't have people that look like us in those key positions, right? So I'm just wondering for yourself, like how do you keep yourself so motivated knowing that you're literally pioneering a new space for everyone? Yeah, you know, I mean, when I was really little, I just didn't even know better, I guess. I just loved the skating. And, you know, when I first started, Dorothy Hamill was my big idol. She was, uh, you know, I started in the late 70s, so she, and she won her Olympic gold in 76. So, um, you know, it was, it was like, oh, wow, Dorothy Hamill. Uh, but, you know, as I got older, um, probably like middle school age, uh, there was another prominent Asian American skater, Tiffany Chin. And she is from the Los Angeles area. Um, and we often competed throughout California. So we made many trips to LA and they came up to Northern California to compete. So I got to see her often and even train with her once in a while. And, um, you know, she was the first Asian American US champion and then was also world bronze medalist. So 
um, she was really blazing the trail. And I think, you know, I was young, but at the same time, identified with that Asian American um, experience. And I think, it, you know, and like you said, seeing her and thinking like, oh, wow, you know, I kind of like her, like, I want to be like her uh, was huge. I think um, there are so many things about her skating that I really looked up to. Uh, technically, she was really um, taking the sport to the next level. And, uh, and she was a very artistic, beautiful uh, skater as well. So I think, um, you know, seeing someone have both of those qualities really um, made an impression on me as a young skater. So I do, I always uh, use her as an example as far as a uh, role model and idol that I looked up to and who, who I feel as an Asian American helped me connect um, with what success as a American skater could look like. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for, for sharing that experience too. And it's so, it's so refreshing to hear that. You know, I think regardless of what time period you're in or with how, how you grew up, it's always great to have like the, the idols and friendly competitions to sort of motivate you. And that's what, that's what happens this podcast is all about, you know, hearing stories like yourself. And we understand that, you know, you're a big idol that we all look up to and understand that you did start somewhere, you know, it's like we're all human mm -hmm. and that we all took our baby steps to get to where we are today. And that's what we want to communicate through this entire podcast. I'm out of curiosity, like as you were training and getting to the Olympics and world championships, like what was the entire process like, you know, did you face any sort of setbacks or, or prejudice or any sort of like, you know, things that's, that you made that nowadays we kind of look back and be like, Hmm, was that exactly okay? <laughs> you know, <laughs> just want to hear some of your stories and your experience in your, in your, in your life. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, it was, it, like you said, it was a long road. It was 14 years for me to, um, you know, eventually uh, earn a berth on the U.S. Olympic team. So it, it was a long road. And, uh, you know, a lot of positive things happen, obviously. And then there are some things where it's just kind of like, yeah, like you said, looking back, it's like, oh, well, maybe, you know, little micro, uh, you know, things here and there. Um, that you think, oh, okay, I think I, I recognize that as, you know, something of being uh, Asian American. I mean, for the most part, I think it's such an international sport that I really focused my energy and everything into, you know, just physically being as trained and prepared and ready and mentally ready for competitions so that my abilities would speak for itself. Um, but yeah, sure, there were times. I mean, I remember my um, second world championships to attend. I was, um, what, what was I? I think I was 19 and it was in uh, Halifax, Canada, which is far, far like past Toronto East. Um, and I landed and was gathering my luggage from security and everything. And um, there were helpers there, right, to gather the skaters and make sure they got to the airport and da, da, da. And I remember I was gathering my stuff and the, uh, you know, the volunteer was like, wow, wow, you speak really good English. <laughs> and I was just, you know, in my, all of my gears is like Team USA and everything. I'm just like, yeah, I, I'm American. <laughs> She's like, oh, okay. Yeah, she, and there was this like a confused look on her face and, you know, I kind of just brush it off. I mean, but the fact that I still remember being asked that and, you know, I think we've all probably been asked as, oh, you speak really good English or your parents speak really good English. It's like, mm, yeah, I'm fourth generation. <laughs> so uh, that's, I don't speak another language. Um, and I, I think another time was actually before that I was at the junior world championships in Australia, Brisbane, Australia. Uh, and this was before you guys were probably even born. It was like 1989. And um, uh, I ended up winning the, the ladies title. And then two skaters from Japan were silver and bronze. So we were waiting for our medal ceremony and it was just taking forever. We were like ready to get on the ice and we're just like, what's taking so long? Like what, you know, let's get, the show on the road here and they're like oh well they only have two Japanese flags and I kind of looked at them and just like um I'm American 
like you need to find an American flag for the first place. <laughs> so, you know, it was just, I mean, and those aren't even bad examples, but you know, they're just little things where it's just like, oh, okay, yeah, I think um, I, you know, because I grew up in California, which is fairly diverse, I just always felt like a California girl and, and whatever. But, um, you know, I think I, I love the fact that nowadays um, it's okay. And I think it's encouraged to, uh, you know, speak up about our uh, Asian American experience and how our families got here and their experience and uh, some of their struggles and challenges uh, because it's, you know, I think just the more we all understand and know about each other um, and, and not just in the, within the Asian community, but in, a, in our country in general, um, you know, just the better it'll be for everyone. Yes, I absolutely agree. I really appreciate you for sharing those stories as well, Christy. And I think it's those moments that, you know, especially when we're young, we don't really think about them when they're happening, right? But when we grow older and we look back into the past and we're like, oh, maybe that didn't sound too right, right? But I'm so glad that we're as an Asian community and yeah, like you said, not only Asian communities, but other minority groups as well, we're finally kind of speaking up now, especially after the pandemic and what we've experienced. And I feel like the Asian community is really finding its own voice. And I'm so, so glad to hear um, that the, we're trending into that direction, but really appreciate you for sharing those stories. And um, also, hold on, hold on, Maggie. I also oh, pains yeah. me a bit to know that it's been like a couple of years, I mean, like at least 20 years or 30 years since that happened that there hasn't been much progress in that side. <laughs> we still hear stories from podcast guests as well about, do you speak really awesome English? And you're like, man, this is like 2015 or something. <laughs> we still ask me that question, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I mean, this is the reason why we also have this podcast too, because we want to stand up for our community and speak out to be like, hey, like, stop. We're American, like, stop othering us, <laughs> you know? You know, right. we're, we're, we're part of society. So that's what we want to highlight. Uh, sorry about that, Maggie, go ahead. No, no worries. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, I really commend you for just having such a strong mindset as well. Like Brian said, I also watched you a lot while I was growing up and my, my mother and father knew I loved watching you so much on screen. And I, I just love the mindset that you have, because I think there's this one line that you always that you said before where it's like you just do your best and forget the rest. And that line is just so powerful. Um, and it's just so inspiring. And I know that you were pairs skater with Rudy Galindo and you won pairs title with Rudy as well. And I think this applies, this can apply to our listeners because you know a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs, small business owners, and it's really important to find a partner that you really you know, connect with and, and, and mm. synchronize with. And you and Rudy you know, became so successful together. Can you talk about that relationship you had with Rudy and what do you think made your relationship with Rudy so successful in your career? Yes, no, absolutely. It was, uh, yeah, a very fun, fun time in our lives when we were uh, skating as partners. Um, pretty much we were paired up. We were very young. I would think I was uh, 11 and he was 13. And if you can imagine, um, you know, Rudy now is probably five, seven on a very tall day. <laughs> so we were very petite little pair team, but we were both very strong single skaters. So as we partnered together, um, we progressed pretty rapidly in uh, the US pair uh, competitive uh, scene. And um, so it, yeah, it, it, it was a great time. And that partnership I think worked and clicked because um, you know, we developed a, a very strong friendship, first of all, but also, you know, a trust in each other and uh, mutual respect uh, for each other. Um, you know, he was, you know, being very strong in single skaters, he was already a novice national champion when I um, became his partner. So I was just in awe and like, oh, why does he want to skate with me? <laughs> but uh, at the same time, you know, he pushed me to improve and to come up to his level. And um, so, you know, I think that trust and respect is just essential in any partnership, whether it's, you know, a personal relationship or a business 
uh, relationship and, um, you know, and sharing that same vision of where you want to go. And we would, you know, intentionally sit down and say, okay, this year we want to work on this, this, and this, and here are our goals and, you know, to make sure we're aligned because, you know, if you don't want to go in the same direction, then that's, that's going to be a problem in the future. <laughs> Absolutely. I completely agree. And I think that goes with any partnership whenever you're working with someone, you have to have the same vision and the same goals. Um, otherwise, you won't really know which direction you're going towards, right? Definitely. So, yeah, we know that, you know, you established the Always Dream Foundation for Children in 1996. Talk a little bit about that and what your purpose was for the Always Dream Foundation at the time that you had created it and how it has kind of changed today. Yes, I mean, yeah, we are in our 21st year and celebrating that. So it definitely has evolved. But um, back in 1996, I mean, it was really shortly after the Olympics in 92, when I had my first experience and hands on experience with the nonprofit um, organization, and that it was the Make a Wish Foundation. And I think really having my eyes open to the, the you know, just the impact you can have on a child's life, whether it was one day, you know, we spent uh, time with the families and with the kids and, uh, you know, really helping them forget some of the challenges that they were facing and for a day, like just bring them fun and happiness. Uh, and it was such a powerful feeling and just rewarding. So I knew I wanted to do more and that that was something that post Olympics would really fulfill and just give me more new purpose and direction. So, uh, so in 96 established Always Dream um, with my co-founder, Dean, and, um, you know, it was all about embracing the hopes and dreams of uh, underserved children. And knowing that I had incredible support and I was fortunate to have, um, you know, family and community and organizations that helped me achieve my dream. And, there's so many kids out there who don't have that kind of, those kind of resources, right, and, and support. So, you know, if we could help, help encourage that dream in a child and then, you know, maybe even have it help them take that first step, then that was the goal. And so we supported a lot of different children's organizations and various um, things, whether it was, you know, computers for after school programs or yeah what else did we do we did a lot of like um supplying sports equipment and a lot of different things um but I think it was back in 2000 and uh 10 11 when I would be what I was a mom and wanted to go all in and say okay let's make a bigger impact and go more narrow and deep in one category. And that's when we focused on early childhood literacy. And I think having kids who were at the time four and six, who were kind of that impressionable, learn to read age, um, we realized that, hey, if, if a child isn't exposed to books, isn't exposed to being read to, their chance of success in school is really hampered. and. Uh, and if they're not successful in school, it's just domino effect from there, right? It's just the, that uh, circle of poverty and homelessness and everything gets compounded. So if we can help build that success, uh, a foundation for the love of books, the love of reading, which will help their academic ex ex success, then let's be a part of that. So, um, so yeah, we really dived into creating a reading program uh, for low-income families and kids and uh, still going strong and we're you know I just came from a planning meeting for the next 35 years and where we are and where we're hoping to go so it's an exciting time. Awesome it's just a huge reflection of who you are as a person you know continuously get back and develop a new generation and create the foundation for them right because you're right I mean reading is not priority when you're struggling <laughs> for your next meal and the fact that you're giving these opportunities kids to be to always dream essentially and think bigger thank you for what you do I mean it's it's awesome to hear that um I do want to take it back a couple of years to 1992 right 
More so than a couple of years, but that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you look so, you look great. Um, so in 1992, like when you competed, man, let's, see, let's even talk about the world championships, right? Before like the Olympics, it was it. If I'm getting this right, is the world championship before the Olympics or after the Olympics? Uh, so the the world championships before the Olympics was in night uh, or March of 1991. Okay, and uh, it was in Munich, Germany. Um, mm -hmm. but it was a, a very pivotal, I think competition for me because it really did set up um that pre-olympic year for me to really you know have the focus and and yeah. everything for so, for february of 92 yeah yeah let's talk let's talk about that real quick like talk about your mindset going to like the 1992 olympic from your success in the like 1991 world, world championship what was your mindset like what was that atmosphere like entering into the competition competition how did you mentally prepare yourself to perform in front of millions of people around the world? But on top of that, like, how did you take care of yourself? How did, what, what did you eat? How many hours did you sleep? <laughs> did you tell yourself affirmations <laughs> growing up? Like, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be a winner. I'm going to be an Olympic champion. Like, you keep telling yourself that. What was the internal voice that was going inside your head as you were entering this competition and in terms of, like, being very meticulous about your preparation as well? Like walk us through mm -hmm. that from, from day one of like after winning your world championship in 1991. What was that? All right. All right. I feel I could be an Olympic champion now. What was the, what was the preparation mindset yeah. where you're telling yourself? Yeah, it was, um, yeah. Coming off of the 91 worlds and having my first world championship win, it was interesting because I had actually won that world title before I even had won a U.S. national title. So it felt really good because, you know, I felt like, oh, I'm never even going to be the best in our country. Like, how does that even compare then to the world? So being able to walk off the world championships, it just, it was a huge shot of confidence, um, not only in my skating, but, um, you know, how I just felt I was accepted into a role of being considered a uh, you know, an, an Olympic uh, hopeful and also just a contender for an Olympic medal. So, um, so it was pretty huge and it was, um, you know, a big turning point. And so preparing for the Olympics after that, it, you know, I always sit down, sat down with my coach, Christy Ness at the beginning of the year. And we kind of mapped out the summer, you know, when I would pick out new music. And then when I would go to work with the choreographer to create the routines for that competitive year um, and what content we were planning to put in the program. And I don't, uh, yeah, you guys probably, well, super young, but the big talk that year was the triple axle. And, you know, uh, from 1998 Olympics, uh, going into the 92 games, there was just a huge, uh, jump in technical uh, prowess, I guess you could say, in the women's figure skating world. And that was a lot due to my nemesis. Well, I wouldn't even say she was my nemesis, but my biggest competitor, Midori Ito from Japan. And she had really pushed the boundaries technically, was doing every triple jump in the book, including the triple axle, and even doing triple, triple combinations. So everyone knew if we wanted to compete and be competitive with her, we needed to up our game and, and be up there too. So, so yeah, it was just like, okay, making that plan and trying to stick with it. And, you know, training was the main focus. It was just what we always call groundhog day, right? It was the same thing. It's like, get up, uh, get to the rink, do my on ice training, have a little bit of a break, go do some off ice training, and then it was just really rest and recover, like have a good dinner, um, which looking back now, I'm not sure like my nutrition was probably the best. Um, you know, there's a lot more nutrition science these days than back in 1992. But uh, and then, you know, I was in, in bed fairly early, probably like nine o'clock or 10. And then, up, uh, you know, at that point, it was after my high school days. So I didn't have to get up so early anymore, but, um, it was really rest and recover and be ready for that same training the, the next day. 
Um, and this was for several months until we had the competition season starts in um, really October. So at that point, it's like you're gearing up and you're starting to showcase, you know, what you're going to put out there for the Olympics. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like, oh, you don't want to peak early, right? And leave everything on the table in the fall. And then by February, it's just like, ugh, you're already going downhill. So, you know, it, it's a little strategic and um, it's like walking on, it was, you know, walking on eggshells, I would say all year. <laughs> I just, you don't want anything to go wrong. Like, you know, getting sick or getting injured. Um, you know, making sure you have the, you know, eight to nine hours of sleep. Um, so your body is ready to train again. And um, yeah, it was almost like you, you, just, you can't even breathe the wrong way. Otherwise it's like, oh no, something might go wrong. <laughs> um, so it was a huge, huge, um, you know, honor when the U.S. championships came around in January and, um, that, you know, it was decided that there who was going to represent the U.S. at the Olympics. So once I was named to the team, it was kind of like a huge uh, relief and, and just a moment where it's like, okay, this is the culmination of what I've worked my whole life for. And, you know, at that point you're like, oh, it doesn't even matter what happens at the Olympics. I've made the team, I'm an Olympian and that's, that's okay. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's so insightful to hear that and just the preparation in place. I, I'm very much the same way. It's like, if I'm preparing something really hard, I had to breathe a certain way, wake up a certain angle. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So it just, it just comes to show how meticulous you have to be it, for preparation for the Olymp Olympics, right? So let's jump into the Olympics competi competition itself. Like, what was that atmosphere like knowing that, all right, you got past the fact that you are an Olympian, but now you're rep representing the, the United States at the Olympics as Olympian and, and had the opportunity to be an Olympic champion what was that? What was that feeling like? Like stepping onto the ice and having all the lights mm -hmm. on you. Like, how'd you keep yourself calm? Because I would imagine this is your mm -hmm. first Olympics. You, you must have a lot of nerves into place. I don't know how you deal with nerves. We want to ask you that question too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just dealing with like the pressure. You know, the pressure from yourself and the pressure from your fans and your supporters as well. I'm sure. You know, you had to develop such a such a thick skin and a strong mm -hmm. mindset. I want to know about that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just want to hear that. What was the air feel like when you was walking there? Was like, it was cold? Was it warm? Was it like, I feel it, I got it. Or like, oh no, I'm scared. You yeah. Know? What was the feeling like? You guys like? got me like sweating. Like I'm already like getting nervous. Again. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, it was trying to, you know, it, I mean, the preparation, like, like I said, started all years ago and then fine-tuned through that season and you know I mean one of the tricks I always my coach always kind of um, used on her students and you know I really used it um, a lot was when we we're training every day in practice anytime I put my music on to practice my routine I would put myself in that moment like okay this is it like all the judges are sitting there the you know, uh, you're at the Olympics or you're at the world's whatever, you're at this very big competition and like, you can't miss anything or, you know, this is it. Like I would try to put myself there and bring my nerves up even in practice so that, um, you know, I just knew what it was like. And she would, you know, I mean, she, she I, she was an amazing coach and amazing and uh, really training her students to be prepared mentally and physically. And, you know, she would be tough on this. I mean, she would make me so nervous to the point sometimes where it's just like, oh, I don't even want a lesson today. <laughs> but in some ways that was her strategy to, you know, condition us to deal with the pressure and to be able to perform under that pressure and know that we could do it. So, you know, the Olympics came, and I was getting ready for the first part of my competition, which was a short program, what they call now short program at the time was called original program, but it was eight required elements that you have to do. Um, and um, it's just, 
it, yeah, so nerve wracking. Like I was like getting ready and I was almost like, oh my God, why am I doing this? Why, what, why did I pick this sport? Like, I don't even, can I just go home? Like, the, like, you know, all those doubts keep coming into your head and just all of that. And, um, the, you know, one of the great things is that someone brought in a note from my choreographer and they said, this is from Sandra and, you know, good luck tonight. And I read it and she said, you know, when we were choreographing this program, it's to the blue, it's a waltz to the blue Danube. And, you know, she said, this is your moment. This is your ball. And we always said it was like my debutante ball, this program. And uh, she's like, just go out there and enjoy it and wow them. Uh, you know, you're gonna be great. You know, I, I don't know. It was a, a very short note, but, um, it put me into that side, okay, she's right. Like we've, I'm ready for this moment. I've trained, you know, just go out there, enjoy the moment. And, you know, this is my ball, like go out there and take it. So um, kind of that Cinderella moment, right? <laughs> I mean, it was still nerve wracking, but I think um, I took a deep breath before the music started. And as soon as the music started, I just always tried to go and focus on the sound of the music and just letting my body do what it was trained to do. And each, you know, I was very consistent skater in the sense that, you know, I did things the same all the time and even in practice so that, you know, when it, you, it, you can easily, more easily go into that um, automatic mode when even when the pressure is on. So, so partly that the preparation, but you know, also, um, you know, there is a lot of positive self-talk. I don't, yeah, I, back in those days, I'm not sure what they called it, but you know, keeping the negative comments out of your head as much as possible, like, oh no, don't fall, like, that, like not thinking that, but thinking like, okay, skate fast, like bend your knees, like you know, take one thing at a time. That was one of my coaches, like always last words to, to me as I went out to skate my routine is like one thing at a time because you can't be thinking five things down the road because then you're just going to mess up what's right in front of you, right? So um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answered anything. <laughs> no, that answered a lot of things. I mean, it's, you just put us in the moment, you know, it's like, we're like, Imagine yourself on the ice. It's like, okay, one thing at a time, doing things correctly, taking in the moment. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just really grateful at the time there's no social media to kind of cloud your, <laughs> your judgment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel so much for the athletes these days or just anyone, you know, in the public eye because there's, you know, there is enough back then if you like actually read an article and you're just like, <gasps> Like, I can't believe they're saying that about me, but I can't imagine like countless millions of people being able to comment their opinions, you know, whether they're a subject matter expert or not, you know, they just <laughs> offer it up and it, it's hard. I mean, I, that's my biggest advice to a lot of young athletes is like, great to be on social media. You almost have to be, but don't read the comments <laughs> like good or bad, you know, it's they're not always going to be accurate so try not to even though we all do anyway right yeah I mean definitely agree with you I mean it's so hard this is another topic we want to talk about in a bit but like just talking about we're still talking about 1992 after winning your Olympic gold how has your life changed in terms of like your, your media presence and and just being the Olympic champion, you know, like how have that yeah. turning point been where you're like, well, I am a celebrity now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Everybody knows my name. <laughs> what, was the, what was the turning point like for you? Um, well, it's interesting because the world championships happened like a month after the Olympics and um, Oakland, California was hosting it. So it was like, it was a given I was going to go home kind of to my backyard and defend my world title. So there wasn't a whole time, a whole lot of time to just like sit and bask in like Olympic glory because I, I was like, oh, I have a world title to, to defend. And like, everyone's like, stay focused. So I was just like, okay. And you know, at the time my coach was living in Edmonton, Canada. So I literally went from the Olympics back to Canada 
And, you know, I mean, they adopted me as like, oh, you know, nice American skater. Um, but, you know, Edmonton's tiny. So, you know, I was able to just focus and train and da 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 da. Um, but in, bet in between, like a couple of weeks after I came back to North America from the Olympics, I had an appearance in Dallas, Texas, Dallas and Houston. Um, that was planned, you know, way before the Olympics happened. They had no idea I would win. But um, it was at the Galleria Malls and they had ice rinks in the malls. And so I went to their tree lighting, or I don't know, I can't even remember what it was. I think it was, yeah, maybe, no, it was after the Olympics. So I can't remember what it was. It was just some skating event. And we got to the mall and it was just, there was like a backup for blocks to get to the mall. Um, but they got me in and, you know, and when I skated, there were people like, in the trees in the mall trying to look down onto the ice and uh like people 10 people deep and the mall was just like what is going on here and i like i've never had security before ever but just to get from this you know one part of the skating rink to the other i had to have like a wall of security around me just to walk and i was just like what is going on is this what it's like to be a rock star so i i think at that point i realized wow a lot of people watch the olympics you know because when you're in france you just you, your family's there and friends and whatever but um it that i think was just kind of eye-opening and shocking it's just like i wow that there was a lot of people watching and a lot of people supporting the olympians you know while you're there and um but it was i think it's kind of you know through that year everything was just um you know a, like a dreamlike state like I, it's it didn't really sink in of all that was happening until maybe literally probably like a year later <laughs> Well, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I can't imagine how much your life has changed after the Olympics and I appreciate sharing that story a lot. It's, it's so amazing to hear. I know Maggie has something to say too. I look at her, I'm looking at her face right now. She's like, I want to say something. <laughs> Go ahead, Maggie. No, I'm just in awe as well. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like for you, Christine, at such a young age as well. It's, you know, I'm sure it was so shocking to you, but also, you know, it felt good at the same time that you were able to achieve something um, so astronomical. And I'm, I'm just, I, I feel like I'm in the moment when you're actually telling us this story and it's like making my palms sweaty as well. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah, gonna... it's a little crazy. Oh, it's, go ahead, Christy. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no. I was just saying it, it was a little crazy. It was quite the way to to ride after. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there were just things that happened, you know, even today, like, you know, 30 years later, some, certain things happen. And I'm just like, wow, that's that's amazing. Like, I you don't realize when you're competing and just so focused on one little thing, you know, mm -hmm. the impression it makes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, first, I mean, I love, I love your storytelling so much. This in, on this podcast, so I'm kind of, I want to change the subject a bit and talk a little bit more about about mental health because we want to understand like what was your mental health like as you were competing so hard, and what was the mental health like post ice skating, right? Because we talked yeah. to enough athletes before and, and celebrities that you know there is that form of depression that comes when you're not competing anymore and that you have to relook at your life and what is your life's purpose now right mm -hmm. and then for a lot of people that can be a, a trap that can signal a huge depression really so we want to hear from your side of the story too since you had time to since you had since we're reflecting now on your time as an ice skater and then post ice skating what was that transition like on your mental health and how do you keep yourself you know healthy in your mind <laughs> I don't know for lack of a better word yeah. yeah no I think that is a huge pitfall um for athletes in general I mean it doesn't matter what level of athlete you were um but when you focus so much of your energy I mean that's you know high school athletes you know 
then they go to college and they don't have athlete, athletics or, or, you know, college athlete, and there's no more athletics after that. Um, it's a huge transition because really it is a, such a big part of your identity and who you were growing up. And um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing that we're still trying to figure out and tackle, you know, what the best way is to, to um, deal with that transition. And, you know, I think maybe because it's just different for everyone. Um, I think I was very fortunate in the sense that after the Olympics at the time in the 90s, there was a, a distinct line between amateur skating and then professional skating. Uh, that line is no longer there. So I think that's that's what makes it a lot harder for skaters these days. But back then it was very like, we didn't get paid a dime. I mean, maybe if a little bit here and there while we were competing. Um, but, you know, once you, you know, participate in a non-sanctioned event, skating event, then you're considered professional. And then, you know, you join the ranks. And I, after the Olympics, joined a professional tour called Stars on Ice. And I think that really was a godsend in the sense that I was still able to do and perform in my sport and something that I love to do. And I knew there was still so much growing that I could do as not just an athlete anymore, but as then transitioning to entertainer. Um, so, but, you know, at the same time, there was still that like, oh, I'm no longer competing and in that mix, right, of the competition. Um, so it was, uh, you know, in some ways trying to reinvent, right? And that's when you're able to find a way to reinvent yourself that naturally gives you new, more purpose or new purpose, new direction. And so I just, I really, you know, dived into that professional world of figure skating and was so lucky to have the best professionals in the world to uh, be my mentor, to be my examples, you know, Scott Hamilton, Rosalind Sumners, Torval and Dean, Katarina Witt. I mean, these um, even though I was Olympic gold medalist, right, I felt like I was the rookie joining their tour, and I had so much to learn from them, and, um, you know, that just put me in another new mindset of, uh, of goals and challenges to, you know, rise to, um, but, you know, and then there was another transition once I stopped uh, skating altogether as a professional, and that's when I, um, really, you know, after I got married, I toured for a couple more years, but then, um, you know, I stopped touring after 10 years and then we started a family. So yeah, it, it, there are a lot of different phases I think athletes will go through or just anyone who's maybe in a transition period. And, you know, I, my best advice is always like find a new challenge. And, you know, I think if I let the 92 Olympics be the pinnacle of my life at 20, that's kind of sad, you know, to think at 20, life is downhill from there, right? And um, I think finding um, work in the community, finding a way where um, I still felt like I can make a difference was uh, huge. And, you know, today that's, you know, always dream gives me that, that gets me up in the morning, that gets me fired up and, you know, excited to do something to make a, a difference in someone's life and um, you know finding those things in life are just uh, you know what can help I think um, you know maybe not avoid depression but just you know give you that sense of um, you know purpose. being and yeah. purpose yeah yeah I mean this is an amazing transition to our next question, which is one of our final, final two questions, right? What advice would you give to someone who wants to get to ice skating, right? And let's, let's take it up a notch too. How about someone who wants to get ice skating but doesn't have the family means to do it? How can they pursue their passions and goals? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think that's something that there probably isn't one specific answer to. But I mean, as far as 
if you want to get into ice skating, you know, go visit your local rink and try the skating. And most all of them offer, you know, group classes where you can learn some of the basics. And, and then, you know, through those group classes, you also get introduced to many of the teachers who teach at that facility. And at that point, you know, you can maybe get a sense of someone you have a good connection with. And uh, I mean, that's how I started. I liked a particular teacher that my group classes had gone through. And, uh, you know, eventually when I knew I wanted to keep taking lessons, um, I chose her to be my uh, private teacher. And, you know, then at that point, if you want to make a bigger commitment, you can ask for private lessons and, um, you know, just start skating on the public sessions and then, you know, see where it goes from there. Um, but yeah, skating is tough in a way that it's, it, it does get expensive, the more involved you get. And, you know, uh, it's hard because I do see that there is a lot of talent in a lot of different areas uh, and demographics. And sometimes it's like, if you can't afford some of the things that are, you know, require competitive, top competitive skating, it's, it's difficult. Um, but there are people in the skating community who are there ready to help out. So it's advocating for yourself. It's finding resources where you can, um, you know, even if you don't want to be top, top level competitor, there's even, you know, like college scholarship money, um, if you want to continue and compete at the collegiate level, um, you know, diversity is something that is um, something that has, you know, not been great in our sport um, because of the cost. And I know there's organizations out there who are really trying to um, address that. I mean, one organization is called Diversify Ice, and they do offer scholarships to promising up and coming skaters, um, you know, of color to really try to assist them in, in reaching their dreams. Um, there's an organization called Figure Skating in Harlem that introduces the sport um, to, uh, you know, girls of color and their reward for keeping their grades up is uh, our skating lessons. So I think there's a lot of innovative ways and uh, ways people can come together and, and help um, diversify our, our sport a little more. Yeah, thank you so much for offering that advice. I, I, I definitely agree that, you know, we do need to di diversify in, in many different sports. Um, and I think we're finally seeing more and more faces that are of, you know, Asian descent, but I think we still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you've really pioneered this space, like Brian said, right? And I, I am just like so happy to, you know, be able to share your story with us today. Um, and going back to your original point, you know, I'm so glad that you were able to find new directions and new challenges, you know, and you served as such an inspiration for so many young um, athletes and young girls and boys, right? And you continue to do so to serve as an inspiration. You know, you're continuing to give back by serving the community through the Always Dream Foundation. And you wrote a couple of children's books as well. <laughs> um, you know, to your earlier point, you know, it's so important for us to continue reading to children and making sure that they're comfortable with reading. So I love, I love, love, love what you're doing. Um, what do you think is next for you, Christy? And how do you see yourself, you know, serving the community and continuing to, to be the amazing Christy Yamaguchi that you are today? I want to add on top of that question too. Is your ice is, is your kids a part of ice skating? Because <laughs> you guys are. <laughs> they were. I mean, uh, they both learned. They went through the group lessons. Like I was in the older one after her, you know, few months of group lessons. She's like, okay, I'm done. I know how to skateboard and backward. That's an, I'm like, okay, good. You need to find your own path. The younger one actually, she skated for several years and she is, she just turned 16 and she stopped skating back in September, which was, you know, a little tough, but at the same time, I knew um, it wasn't going to be her thing, you know, but she accomplished, you know, a good amount of um, levels in her skating career. Uh, so I knew it was time to move on. Um, 
as far as wait, what was what was your question, Maggie? For, uh, oh, just to ask, what's next for you? And, oh, what's next? Yes. <laughs> you know, it's um, you know, there's a lot of obviously focus with Always Dream and its growth. We're in California, Arizona, and Hawaii as far as uh, schools that we serve at the kindergarten level, and uh, you know, we're looking to really accelerate our expansion and go a lot deeper and serve uh, more students. I mean, we have an ambitious goal of maybe 5,000 individuals, you know, students and their family members uh, in five, three years and 10,000 individuals uh, come, you know, five years from now. So a lot of focus will be on that. Um, I do hope to write, continue writing some more children's books. Um, not sure if I'm ready for a memoir or anything yet. <laughs> but maybe someday in the future. So uh, yeah, continuing to, you know, write and, um, and, and stay involved in the Asian American community. Um, you know, we've had it really tough the last couple of years. And, you know, I have uh, obviously big heart for uh, the Japan towns that are still in existence in the US. I mean, there's really only two left, San Francisco and Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, doing what I can, whether it's, by voice or even um, any way I can to, to help preserve some of that uh, culture as well. Amazing. Well, we thank you for everything you're doing. And it was such an honor to have you on our show today. For our listeners on the podcast, where can they find out more about you online and uh, the Always Dream Foundation as well? Uh, sure. Well, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, <laughs> I guess Facebook too. And really just Christy Yamaguchi are my handles. Um, alwaysdream.org is our website for Always Dream. And uh, and I just wanna put it out there too. You know, thank you, uh, Maggie and Brian for what you do in creating the Asian Hustle Network because I think um, that was long overdue, but I think it's just an incredible way for uh, people to connect to really, find out what other people are doing and collaboration. I think it's just, it's the way, right? And um, together, I think we're so much stronger. And so congratulations and, you know, thank you guys for, for all you do. That is, that is such an honor to hear that from you. I never in my life would think that I would hear that from you. <laughs> but, but thank you so much for your encouragement. And it's, again, what Maggie said too, it's such an honor to have you on the podcast today. An honor meeting you. We can't wait to see what your next chapter, how your next chapter will unfold, and we'll be there to support you every at every step along the way. Oh, appreciate that. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank, Thank you, Christy. You, Christy.